Hi, this is E. David Crawford from the University of Colorado. Just recently, there was a release of information on a large international trial involving radium-223, Sofigo, in men who had metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer and were treated either with abiraterone and radium-223 or abiraterone and placebo. And in this study, there were almost 800 men. The results of which were reported by a data safety and monitoring committee of an increased rate of fractures and deaths among men on the Zofigo combination arm. We know that Zofigo has been around for a number of years. It was studied in a large Alsimca trial, which was one of the first with radio pharmaceuticals to show in an improved survival with this alpha particle. Since then, radium has been extensively evaluated and, and used in the practice of uh, treatment of castrate-resistant prostate cancer. It's been used before and after chemotherapy, before and after uh, abiraterone, adenosylidamide, and so forth. So to discuss the findings of this study with me today is Dr. Phil Koo, who is a nuclear medicine physician at the Banner MD Anderson Hospital in Phoenix, Arizona. Phil specializes in theranostics and, and nuclear medicine, and has been a real leader in this area regarding uh, Zofigo. So we're gonna ask him to share with us his, his thoughts. I would preface this and say that we don't have any of the data other than what's been released in this uh, letter from Bayer to physicians. Phil? Great. Thank you, Dave. It's uh, great to be here. And uh, so this came as a surprise to many of us in the prostate cancer community, uh, but it really challenged us to think about, you know, how we're treating patients, what we need to do, and what the future holds. The preliminary data uh, from that independent ad hoc analysis showed that the, inc the incidence of fractures was 24% um, in those patients receiving Abby plus radium-223 versus 7% in those who were receiving um, Abby plus placebo. And death was 27% versus 20%. And it was roughly 400 patients uh, for each group. So based on that preliminary data, the study was unblinded. As their letter states, it is uh, correct to, at this point, to stop using radium-223 with abiraterone concurrently. That being said, doesn't mean we should stop using radium-223. There's still um, an abundance of data. Radium-223 is an effective drug, and it is a safe drug. It's just a matter of how best to use it. So um, by concurrently, you mean, uh, Bill, that uh, going forward using abiraterone uh, at the same time with uh, radium-223, we shouldn't do this, but we have plenty of experience with using radium uh, after abiraterone or um, after chemotherapy, before chemotherapy, and so forth, correct? Correct. So, so that's a great point. You know, I think in my mind there are two approaches to these combination therapies. There's a combination therapy where you start the two together versus the layering approach where someone's on a therapy and then you add on another therapy on top of this which leads to some you know, speculation with regards to why we saw the, these results. We do know that patients who are started on abiraterone have a flare response on bone scan. Uh, so what that means is a patient may have a baseline bone scan. One, once they start Abby, oftentimes you see new bone lesions on a bone scan. And then on a follow-up bone scan after that, oftentimes those bony lesions improve. And this was seen in some phase two data uh, presented at GU ASCO in 2010. I wonder if that flare response working with the radium is what caused some of this, uh, these adverse events to occur in these patients who received combination abiraterone with radium-223 simultaneously. I think it was in a three to seven day window. I think we have to be very careful with this. The flare with abiraterone um, could actually be a good thing. It's um, it, the infiltration of T cells and inflammation and things like that, and turnover of calcium, which uh, would show up in the bone scan as uh, increased activity. Um, and I think what you're saying, it, it could be possible that that delivered more 
radium to the lesion and it could explain some of this but again that's totally theoretical activity on a bone scan may be good or bad uh it may be a sign of healing or it may be the sign of destruction joining us now also in this discussion is dr neil shore uh, who is from myrtle beach south carolina i can't think of anyone who's more involved with uh advanced and castrate resistant prostate cancer than uh, dr shore you know that th whatever is happening in bone has to do something with uh, the attraction of radium 223 there increased turnover and, and promote it by abby at least initially because when you use uh, radium in patients that already been on abby and don't have that flare then at least that has not been seen correct I'm not aware of it, and you know it is interesting in our in our in my in my study, um, almost everybody, but well, two thirds of the patients had been had been on Abby for at least two months, so the sort of the flare you could argue had when they started the radium had sort of maybe they were starting the radium post flare, as opposed to, I don't know in the so it would be interesting to look at the ER and the era two two three what exactly the breakdown of the timing so you, we know that not everybody started simultaneously on both drugs same day right i think those are all great points from what i hear about era 223 i i, I had heard that the patients were all started within like a three to seven day window where they got the abby and radium 223 so i think that's a great point neil that you know that's completely different from your trial where if they started two months been on abby for two or three months i mean that's a, a completely different scenario physiologically i think that could that, that's an interesting thing so that that could be a big part of it and I, your your concept of um you know flare a, a different type of flare is important and neil what you said uh right on about looking at um imbalances in the in the treatment what is there, sort of your take-home message for you know urologists and medical oncologists then here you know my thoughts are obviously it's it's too early and we don't have any of the data, so this is all speculation and conjecture, as you mentioned. I think we just have to wait to see, you know, what the, the how the patients with denosinab did. Were there any geographic variations? But, you know, just be cautious, I guess, for the time being, since we don't have a lot of these answers. And the other thing is that it could be, with further follow-up, some of these lesions are actually uh, responding and uh, you see some change in the bone manner. Yeah, and then you get yeah. you get those fractures with bisphosphonate uses that, you know, how many of these are those bisphosphonate-related fractures? But, yeah, that's a great point. Great. Well, you know, uh, I appreciate it. And it may be premature to talk about all this stuff. It's conjecture because we don't have the data. Uh, uh, it, it's interesting to look at what we do know uh, and try to come up with biological uh, explanations for this thing. So more to come on this.